Good morning, everyone. Tell me, has spring arrived? I believe it has. What a great week we've had. What a great and beautiful day we have this morning, and we see God's hand, and it is truly a blessing. Again, it's great to see everybody, especially our visitors. Thank you for being with us. You are our honored guest, and hopefully we can get around and, and talk with one another after service. So glad everyone is here today, and, and what a great day to worship together. I'd like to read from uh, 1 Thessalonians. If you'd like to follow along, I'll be in verse 12 and through 22. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their own work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort and faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, and abstain from every form of evil. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this, this beautiful day. Uh, help us to rejoice always. Help us to pray without ceasing. And in everything, give thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 944, if you're using your books. Number 944. I can't sing this one without thinking of Joel. Let's please stand. Joy to the world. Number 868, if you're using your books. Number 868. Oh, 
greatest carol ever sung, Jesus, blessed Jesus. To err is human. To really foul things up takes a computer. So there we go. Thank you for uh, bearing with us on that one. All right, number 677. 677. Jesus, us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us, hold us, use us, hold us, only let us live in you. Jesus, draw us ever nearer. Hold us in your loving arms. Wrap us in your gentle presence. When the end comes, bring us home. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 221. 221. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the ocean with a light? Oh, 
we partake of the Lord's Supper, I just want to read a brief passage from Genesis chapter 3. To look at sin entering the world, consequence of sin, and God's plan for salvation of the people he created and loved. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not, you sh will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed, sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father, Lord God, as we come before you this morning, we take a look back at the world that you created. That was without blemish, without sin. That was a paradise. That was very good. You see the sin that then entered. And so many consequences that came out of that sin. All the hardships and strifes. Sickness, and toils, relationships broken down, death, and separation from you. And yet you did not leave us alone. Even at the moment that sin entered this world, you promised us a savior. You promised us one who would, who would free us from our sins, who would save our souls, who would fix our relationship with you and each other. And Lord, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for Christ, 
who fulfilled that. Who by his own body on the cross took our sins upon himself. Who as an innocent died in our stead, paid the price we could not. Lord, we, as we partake of the bread in memory of the body broken, Lord, we pray your blessing on us. Pray that we might partake in a manner worthy. Lord, we pray and give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Holy Father, as we come before you remembering and thinking of your Son, you remember the, the nails that pierced his hands and his feet, the spear that pierced his side, we remember the blood that freely flowed. And it's by that blood that, that we are cleansed, that we are covered. And our sins no longer have a hold on us. Lord, as we partake of this fruit of the vine in memory of that blood we pray your blessing upon us pray that we might partake in a worthy manner Lord we ask all this we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Amen we partake of the offering, or not partake, before we offer up a prayer for the offering, I wanted to read a few verses from Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, the prophet writes to his people, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, declares the Lord. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourers for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father, We thank you and bless you for all of your many blessings and gifts that you pour out on us. Each and every day, Lord, we see your hand at work. We see the blessings that you freely provide us. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to have that same heart and mentality that you show that freely gives, that freely blesses. I pray that our offering to you would be used for your glory, to further your kingdom. It might be used to 
call sinners to repentance. That might be used to tell the world of your son. The faith, the hope that we have in him. The eternal life to follow. Lord, we pray your blessing. We pray your guidance and direction. And all this we ask and pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. If you're using your hymnals, our song after Greg's lesson this morning will be number 211. 211. Our song before scripture and prayer will be number one. Number one. If you would please join me in standing and for the scripture reading to follow. To God be the glory. This morning will be John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. 
Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for this family here, and this opportunity to be together, and to worship, and learn from your word. We are so thankful for Jesus his example, his message, and his sacrifice. Through Jesus, there are overflowing gifts and blessings. Through Jesus, we see your glory. And through Jesus, we have the opportunity to be with you one day. It's through him we pray. Amen. Good morning, Signal Mountain. It's always good to be together, as David likes to say, and it's a good day today. I was talking about how spring is here, and uh, Jessica reminded me maybe next week it's going to go away a little while, but it will be back. So we are blessed to have a wonderful day to join together and worship and, and celebrate God's goodness. I want to start, though, with a prayer for our, our brothers and our sisters in Ukraine and in Russia. We have family in both places in Christ and um, I was just at a preacher's meeting Monday and one of the guys who'd been to Russia several times was talking about how, how grieved the church is over what's happening and of course in Ukraine they're facing the, the wrath of, of what's going on so would you bow with me in prayer for those folks Father we are so blessed to be able to come before you and to seek your blessing upon those we love and care about as well as those we don't even know that are your people, that are our family. And we want to lift up this whole situation between Russia and Ukraine, what is happening, and we ask, Lord, we know that your hand is in this, and we are not, uh, you're not surprised, and you're working, and so we can trust in your hand to work out what is good for those that love you and are called according to your purposes. And we would just pray especially for our our Christian family, they're there in that place, in that time. Please give your blessing to those who follow you, Lord, and help them to be a light in this dark time. And for us, O oh Lord, the same, that we would be a light to those around us. We pray for protection, uh, but mostly for faithfulness. Father, help us to remember that, that uh, it's not about safety, it's about being saved that counts the most. And keep our focus on that which lasts and to remember this world is a place of sojourning and preparing and a place of testing. Help us to be faithful and pass the tests. And for those who are in the face of this harm's way, we pray your special peace and blessing. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Uh, at the end of class, in our adult class, Steve had a one question he wanted to share. And I think it's a good introduction to my lesson. So I want to give it to you now. If you had to argue... For the reality of the gospel, if you had to defend the gospel and argue for its reality by giving one example of how you have been changed as a result of your faith, what would you share? What would you tell? If you, could, you wanted to prove that God's working in your own life and you had to argue for the reality of the gospel, giving one example of how you've changed as a result of your faith, what would you share? Well, John wrote a whole book about that, and that's what we're studying right now. The Gospel of John are the stories that he gives us that are unique in many ways to the other Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a similar message. There are differences in each, but uh, John is completely unique, and it really focuses on Jesus' own words and interaction and defense. And we see him in a one-on-one -on -one situation over and over, how Jesus defends the Gospel himself as the one who came from God. And today, uh, we're going to look at our third lesson in John's Gospel. is on 
how God shows his glory through Jesus. We have seen, it says in chapter 1, we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. How did Jesus show his glory? How did he reveal that? And we'll see that in our look at John's gospel today. Um, John begins by saying Jesus is the word of God, who was with God, who was God. And that word, he says, was made flesh, down in verse 14 of chapter 1, and he dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. After calling his disciples, as we, if you've read along in chapter 1 there, uh, Jesus begins to reveal his glory by performing signs. John uses the word sign exclusively in reference to miracles that Jesus gave. And the question arises, as we read a book like this today, is did Jesus do these miraculous signs or not? Now you're here today, and I assume that all of us believe that Jesus did these miraculous signs. Can I get a witness? <laughs> okay, we believe it, right? We believe he really did these miracles. But it's the miracle themselves in today's world that make people go, ah, that's a fairy tale. Isn't that interesting? But that, a miracle is not the only way Jesus gave a sign. And so we'll see that as we look in the gospel here. If you'd been there, if you'd been at that wedding and you saw what happened, you would have been impressed. But you know what? We're going to find that those kind of impressions that a miracle can have don't necessarily have the impact they need to have to build saving faith. They get your attention, they point, but they don't save. Those who are saved are those who accept it and continue. And we'll see how they continue as we look at today's lesson. But did Jesus perform those signs or not? If he didn't, if he didn't, then everything else we read about Jesus is based on lies. But if Jesus did these things, if he is God made flesh, <laughs> and he did these things, we have evidence by which we can say, this shows he was God. And by the way, the people who saw these things were unable to show that he didn't do them. In fact, many of them will say, we can't say that he didn't do this. So what are we going to do? Those are ways the sign works. It forces you into a decision. Will I choose to believe or not? And in the, fa in the force of even a miracle, many people chose not. We'll see that in John's gospel. In chapter 2, John spreads the table for us here for the first sign of Jesus in his gospel. And it's a wedding table. The setting is a wedding. And so we see the sign here at this wedding. What do you think of weddings? If you're a dad, you may think it's expensive, you know. If you're a young lady, you might be thinking, wow, it's beautiful, right? It's wonderful. Weddings are a celebration. A celebration of unity between a man and a woman. God's way. And it's a beautiful thing. Did you know that Jesus is betrothed to a wife? Did you know that? There's a wedding of the Lamb that's coming. It's coming. In fact, John's Gospel has another strong allusion to this wedding ideology and, and motif in chapter 14. If you have your Bibles there, go over with me to John 14. Jesus, is, Jesus here in this setting is preparing his disciples for his departure. It's a Passover feast and has gathered the disciples, Jesus with his disciples, to share this Jewish feast on the very night that he's arrested and taken to be condemned to the cross the morning after. In John 14, verses 1 through 4, we have what has been used in funerals ever since. But the real message of Jesus is a message of great hope, of celebration. The bridegroom will be taken away, but he will come back, and he will bring his bride home to his father's house, where he goes to prepare a place for them. Look at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. You may have mansions. The word manse means room, actually. Or 
In my house, father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself. Good translation. So that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, you might not hear wedding bells in this a little bit, but you need to remember the way the Jewish weddings worked. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells a parable of the ten virgins. Five are wise and five are foolish, and they're out there waiting on what? The returning of the groom, okay? They're waiting on the groom to come back. Where is the groom? He's gone to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride. And once he's finished, everybody's waiting on it. The five foolish come unprepared with not enough oil. The five wise have enough oil. So when the groom comes, he's here. It's a big celebration. Those who are prepared go to be with him and join in the great celebration. Those who are unprepared miss out. And Jesus is using that illusion in John 14. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. It's a beautiful picture of love and embrace between the bride and the Lord. The bride of the Lamb. So, John 2 reveals to us how Jesus introduces his signs at this wedding feast where he turns water into the very best wine. This sign wasn't fully public. But Jesus' disciples knew it had happened, and Jesus' mother knew that it happened, and the servants who drew the water knew that it happened, and Jesus has transformed this water into these, in these stone jars were full into the best wine. Let me just say this. In Christ, the best is saved for last. It's coming coming. The best is coming. In this world you will have tribulation, said Jesus, but be of good cheer, says John. I've overcome the world. He says he's telling us about a wedding where it's going to be all joyful, all celebration, eternal love expressed forever. When Jesus performs this sign, what does the Bible say in John chapter 2 verse 11? What does it say? This is this, the beginning of his signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus did what? He showed his glory. He's, he's pulling back the curtain a bit and letting the disciples see behind. Whoa, who is this? He reveals his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Mine says, actually a better translation, the disciples believed in him. They believed in him. That's John's word over and over. They believed. The gospel of belief. By the end of this chapter, in chapter 2 and verse 23, when Jesus has gone to Jerusalem at the Passover feast, we see what happened there. What happened in verse 23 is this. Many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing. And it says that they, what? They believed, right? Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing, and they believed in his name. They believed in his name. So how did Jesus respond to this belief? Because of the signs. Did he say, great, mission accomplished, all is well and good, right? Is that what he said? The Bible says that he would not entrust himself to them because Jesus knew all men. He knew what was in a man. And Jesus knows what's in us too, doesn't he? He knows. And easy believism is not saving faith. It's not. True faith is refined by trials. It's tested. And proven pure, like gold, is refined. Peter talks about that. The Bible all through talks about that. What we see is there's two tracks of believing that go on in John's gospel. One is believing that receives salvation and leads to an obedience and an open confession of Jesus as the Christ. That's what God wants. 
That's why John wrote this gospel. But we also see another track. The other is believing that remains in darkness. Sometimes because of fear of rejection. Sometimes because of just selfishly wanting my physical needs met. You made bread before, do it again, we believe. And sometimes just the love of things in this world. So an unwillingness to let go of the world and receive God's gift of grace through Jesus. John 2 begins with Jesus' sign at this wedding, which the disciples saw, and it says they believed. That's the beginning. It's the start. But even in John 14, he's going to say, you believe in God, believe also in me. That belief has to grow into something rich and strong and saving. When John takes us to Jerusalem, where Jesus is in the temple, and he clears the temple, this time, the disciples see what Jesus did, and they remember what? You look down in verse 12 and following. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers, his disciples. They stayed there a few days, and when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple course, he found the men selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. He made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, scattered the coins of the money changers, overturning their tables. And those who sold the doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Woo! What the disciples saw was a sign. They saw a sign. It wasn't a miracle in the sense of un you know, just out of the blue, something you'd never expect, like a bone hitting knitting or, a, or a eyes opening that were blind. But what they saw was this. In verse 17, his disciples remembered what? They remembered the word of God. It was written of him. Zeal for your house will consume me. This sign of Jesus got a response from the Jewish leadership too. What question do they ask Jesus in verse 18? You got your Bibles open there, right? The Jews demanded of him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? What sign will you do? The disciples have already seen the water turn to wine, and now they're seeing Jesus doing something, and they remember the verse that said so, and now they're watching the opposition occur, right? So Jesus offers those who ask him for a sign another sign. <clears throat> This will be the one that they themselves in the future will do to Jesus. He says, destroy this temple, verse 19, and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. By the way, it wasn't even finished in that day. It's taken 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. Listen to this. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and they believed. I thought they already believed back in chapter 2. They believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. There's something that we can hang on to, right? We can believe the scripture and the words Jesus spoke. That is our evidence. I don't know what you think of that, but to me, that's impressive. Now, John's gospel is going to begin driving home how saving faith needs more than seeing a miracle. Saving faith must see Jesus as fulfillment of God's word. And then we're going to see that abiding in God's word is where you truly know you're a disciple. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Signs and miracles have occurred all throughout history in the Scriptures, have they not? I mean, from the beginning of creation all the way through, we read of these incredible times of God. God's people have often seen some of the greatest miracles of God, and they believed in God, but they did not receive the salvation work of God. Think of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. How many of them, what did they see? What did Israel see? Water turned to blood. Frogs, lice, fries, fries, yeah. 
Five guys and fries. Flies, or lice, I don't know what they were. Darkness, death of the firstborn were the last two. And when these signs occurred, they saw and witnessed what was going on, and then they're led out to the wilderness, and they're there at the Red Sea, and here comes Egypt after them with the army. And Moses is told by God, tell them to go forward. Hold out your staff. And he does. And the sea parts and they walk across the Red Sea. And then when the Egyptians try to follow, it collapses on them and destroys them all. They saw that. They witnessed that. They even celebrated it. Miriam sang a song and everybody was, all the women were dancing with her and all the people are going, wow, this is awesome. Look at this. Within three months, they are grumbling and complaining as if, God, what are you? Where are you? And when they go to Mount Sinai and they hear the very voice of God telling them, no other God besides me. No images. Moses goes up within 40 days. What are they doing? 40 days! Did they believe in God? Yes. Did they trust Him? No. You see, a great miracle gets your attention. It takes more than a great miracle, though, to save you, except for the great miracle that saves us, which is truly a miracle, too. We find that people have often seen God's signs, but they didn't trust the God who gave them. Who will hear the words of Jesus and the witnesses of Jesus' works and be saved? Who will hear those words today and hear the witnesses of those works of Jesus and words of Jesus and be saved. Listen to John 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who's come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Did Nicodemus believe that Jesus was from God? Shake your head this way. Yeah, he did. Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he confesses to Jesus what the Jewish Pharisees know. It's not that they guess it or they think it. They know it. And when you hear this, what is Jesus' response? Great! I'm so glad you can see so clearly. Whew. Mission accomplished, right? No, no. Look at verse 3. The first thing out of Jesus' mouth after that declaration of knowing that he's from God is, I tell you the truth... No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Wow. You see, you can believe that Jesus is from God and even know it, but not receive him and be born again. This new birth that Jesus speaks of is of water and the Spirit. Not just water, not just Spirit. It's a brand new beginning by God who works on us and in us and through us by His Word and by His Spirit. And God does His works of giving new birth to those who receive Him. You should think back at, verse, at chapter 1 where He says, Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the word is exousia. The Greek word means, it means privilege, right. It means power, authority, to become children of God. To those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of a human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. As Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, he's going to tell Nicodemus of the greatest sign that brings saving faith. Skip down to verse 13 of chapter 3 of John. No one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert... So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His 
only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. This is the judgment. Light has come. In. Here's how it works. Light has come into the world, but what? Men loved what? Darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth, you see this? You see this? He believes and he lives by the what? By the truth. Jesus is the truth. Living by Jesus, living by his words, living by his life, living like him is seeking to purify yourself just as Jesus, keeping your eyes on him, following him. That is saving faith. Anything less is not. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be, may be seen plainly what he's done has been done through God. The very works that the saved do are done through God. We're His workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has done it beforehand. He's doing it. We're not saved by our works. We're saved for works, through His works. Okay? That's where we get it. It is a gift of grace to the believer who seeks His kingdom first, who sees the glory in Jesus, and who will not let Him go. You say, well, how can I build a case so that I can help somebody who just has a hard time seeing God and not believing God to come to this position? How can I do that? Share Jesus with them. Okay? Share the words of Scripture with them. Don't believe... If you think human beings can come up with a better argument for God than God can, then go find it and show it to me. Okay? I think God gave us just exactly what he wants to know so that all who will receive it can. I'm just saying this. Many search the scriptures, even thinking in them that they find life, but they refuse to come to Christ, who is the life. New birth is a work of God. It's a work of God on the one who wants to follow Jesus and believes in him, receives him, walks in the truth, lives by it. Okay. Live by the truth, come to the light, leave the darkness. At the end of John 4, and I'm wrapping up here, the end of John 4, we'll go back to chapter uh, the story of the Samaritan woman, maybe next week, I don't know for sure, but there's this story of an official's son that Jesus heals, and there's a great statement of Jesus that we need to catch to, to get the point. Look in verse 43 through 48 of John chapter 4. After two days, Jesus left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all he had done in, the Jeru in Jerusalem at the Passover, for they also had been there. The signs were getting attention. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. There we are. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. What did Jesus say about the people in verse 48? You got your Bible open? Mine in red says these words. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Does Jesus sound real pleased with that? What message does this give us? Jesus' works of wonders may produce in us attention and a belief that won't save us. 
It takes choosing him, receiving him to be saved. But they can point out who he is, and that's the key to them. They are a sign to who he is. If we look to Jesus, if we listen to his words, if we believe him so that we follow and obey him and demonstrate a saving, that demonstrates a saving faith. Jesus will later say, if you remain in my words, you're truly my disciples. John 8, 31. John 4, 49 shows us what Jesus did in this case. I think it's very interesting. Jesus forced this man to either take him at his word or not. After that statement of Jesus, you'll never believe unless you see signs and wonders, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said, You may go. Your son will live. Hmm. But you won't be there. I don't know if I can trust you. Right? I don't know what he thought, but I know this. He took him at his word. He took him at his word. It says the man took Jesus at his word and he left. Now you think about that. He had faith that Jesus could do it. And he knew if Jesus were there, it would happen. But he's got to now say, you said it. I'm going to trust you at your word. I'm going to go see. I'm going to go see your word fulfilled. He took him at his word, and then he went. And on the way home, I love what happened. While he's still on his way home, his servants met him with the news his boy was living. He asked about the time. What time was it when he got better? And he said, it was the fever left yesterday at seventh hour. And he goes, that's what my sundial watch said when Jesus said those words. It was that time when he spoke the words. When the father realized it was the exact time that Jesus said, your son will live, he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. Uh, as we continue in John's gospel here, the evidence that brings saving faith we'll find is not logical proof, it's not philosophical argument, it's not scientific experimentation. Those things can be very important, they can be very helpful. Because you can see God's glory in what he's done. Don't get me wrong. But saving faith, saving faith is receiving Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God, who came here and gave his life on the cross to save us from our sins, who rose, who reigns, who's coming again. Okay? Saving faith is about abiding in his word until we see him face to face. Do you take Jesus at his word today? Do you take Jesus at his word today? I know you do. And I'm so glad that this church is a church that listens to and pays attention to the words of God in Scripture so we can know who Jesus is and we can walk with Him and be like Him until we see Him. If you're here today and you need to respond to God's call, His call has come. If you hear that voice and you're not ready to meet Him, He wants you to get ready by coming and He will make you ready. He will make you ready. You can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You can be born of water and the Spirit today, right here, right behind me, today. If you need any help at all, we'll pray for you, whatever your needs are. Please come and, uh, while we stand and sing to encourage you.
couple of closing announcements before we uh, before we dismiss. I want to encourage everyone, if you would, to uh, pick up a copy of the bulletin. Uh, most of us get it by email. If you're not getting it by email or getting the emails from the church, please contact the church office. There's a lot of information in there, and we're not going to go over every every item. Uh, I do want to remind everybody: next week is the time change, so spring forward. And I think we lose an hour of sleep. We gotta get confused. Just turn your clocks forward next Sunday, Saturday night. Also, the service for, for Jeannie Nance's mother is this Saturday, the, the 12th. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, Kendall is, make sure he's nodding. Uh, Kendall's going to be preaching next Sunday, Lord willing, to give, uh, give up. Oh, he's hiding, so they will <clears throat> So that's good. Uh, so any, uh, if there are any other, other announcements, if you, and if you need an announcement, put it in the bulletin or sent out by email, please contact the, the church office. Any, any closing other announcements we need to make? What's it? Oh, Will Green was baptized last. Thank you for reminding us that. So we, we rejoice with Will and with the Green family and with our, uh, this, uh, his church family. We're very proud to... Just, it's a glorious time. Thank you for reminding us that. Let's close in a word of prayer, and I'll be mentioning several of our prayer requests that have, uh, have come forward. So let's pray as we close. Our Father, we're grateful for an opportunity to be together as your people. We're grateful for the, the encouragement that we get from each other, the encouragement we get from reading and sharing your word, from singing songs of praise that lift up our spirit, hopefully to commune with your spirit. Where when we have a chance to commune around your table to remember uh, the sacrifice and look forward to the final day when we can be with you. Father, we pray that you will be with those that need your special hand, need your special healing, need your special peace and strength. Lift up uh, John Curtis, his father, with his uh, broken hip and new pneumonia. We lift up Knox McCollum. We lift up October Heartline, who lost... Her parents. We lift up Josephine Trimble, Helen Lane's mother. We lift up Becky Terrell, a member at the Central Church of Christ, and pray for, for her. We lift up Thelma up to graft the mother of, of Dina Marcotte. Uh, I want to just pray that you'll be with, uh, with, with Steve and Penny Lane and give them healing and strength and the, the many others that are on our heart. We pray that you'll be with, especially, Lord, be with your people in the Ukraine. May you protect them but may you give them opportunity to serve in the name of Jesus. We're grateful for the opportunity. We lift up this prayer through the power of the risen Messiah. Amen. Thank you.